It's a great pleasure to hold, hold this event today and to welcome you here to, to the department. Um, it's possibly one of the most interesting and unpredictable elections that we can think of for a generation. And I think that for those of us who study politics is actually a great and yes also a kind of puzzling thing that most uh, people like me who like to forecast elections will tell you that you know most elections are quite predictable and we can look at the polls and we can look at the economy and we can have a good sense of what's going on. But actually this is an election where we were just saying earlier, we, we don't even really, we can't even decide what, it, what number of parties are in our party system anymore. Are we a four party system with adding UKIP? Are we a five party system that adds the, the Greens? Are we a six party system that adds the SNP? And this raises all sorts of uh, interesting questions for British democracy and actually what's going to happen after May 2015, if indeed if there's going to be a clear outcome. Um, ah, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Roger. Take a seat. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome a number of um, speakers to the department today, and, and I will introduce them uh, both in turn in, in detail when they each speak. Uh, all I should just first say that we have uh, Joe Twyman, Alex Kelso, and Roger Casale here, and I think this may be one of our other speakers about on the phone to me. So I'm going to say very briefly, and then I will have to excuse me for a moment while I go and take my phone call, but hopefully find the other speaker, um, to welcome, first of all, Joe Twyman. Joe is the head of political and social research for the pollsters YouGov, um, a survey company that is probably most well known to many of you. Uh, it's been involved in the British election study, I think, since 2005, that's fair? 2001. 2001, in fact. So have been in the forefront of internet uh, polling. Uh, and they're also said to be responsible for giving the Prime Minister stomach ulcers over the poll on the Scottish independence referendum that put the yes vote ahead one time, which caused much controversy. There's now a peer who's trying to put out a uh, piece of legislation that highly regulates polling for people like Joe, you know, worrying for David Cameron. Um, Joe is going to give us an overview, I think, of the general uh, uh, situation regarding the election. Joe, I hope you don't mind if I get a step outside to actually find out on the speaker. The floor is yours, thank and you. Um, I will, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Cheerio. <laughs> the world has changed. I can feel it in the air. I can see it in the water. I can see it in the earth. So begins the film version of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> An epic journey, the tale of an epic journey towards the ultimate final battle between good and evil. And in many ways, the 2015 general election will not be anything like that. <laughs> but where it is important is this idea that the world has changed. I've been studying, in fact I've been working on general elections since 1992. In answer to the question you're all thinking, 14, and yes, a massive geek. <laughs> so since 1992 I've been looking at elections, and 1992 was a bit difficult, but since then, it's been pretty easy. 97, easy. 2001, just as easy. 2005, slightly more difficult. 2010, tough. 2015, really, really difficult. Because in my role as Head of Political and Social Research at YouGov, I am asked on a regular basis, and when I say regular basis, I mean on an hourly basis at the moment, and on a half hourly basis come March, who's going to win the election? And this is where it gets difficult, because we don't even know what win the election means, and I'll come on to that. But this is why it's difficult. It's difficult because the world has changed. We are no longer in an era where 95% of the electorate votes for the two main parties and 80% of the country turns out to vote. Those times have changed, and they've been changing now for 30, 40 years, but over the last parliament, the change has been the most pronounced of that time. And so we find ourselves now in a situation where, if you like, every party is disappointed. And when you look at our polls, when you look at the long-term trends across the five years of this parliament, you can see why they're disappointed. Labour, currently on 33% of the vote, are disappointed. They've been as high as 45%. They need to be probably around 40% if they're going to get a majority. They've been talking about this 35% strategy, and they're on 33 at the moment. And the trend is very slowly downwards, so they're disappointed. 
The Conservatives are disappointed because they're on 33% as well, neck and neck with Labour, and they haven't really moved about a lot. They've been broadly on 33, 35% since the Omni shambles. They haven't recovered from there. And they don't look like they're going anywhere, despite the fact that the economy, people's perceptions of the economy, are improving and their management of the economy is being recognised. They're seen as the best party on the economy by some distance. So why aren't they doing better? And they're disappointed. One half the Conservatives, one side of the Conservatives, I should say, says, oh, well, if only we'd engage with traditional Conservative values, then we'd be doing better. The other side says, no, if only we'd continued the modernisation, then we'd be doing better. And they're both disappointed with each other and probably themselves a bit as well. The Lib Dems are disappointed. The Lib Dems are really disappointed. <laughs> Lib Dems are disappointed because they got 24% of the British vote at the last election, and they're now on 7%. They got disappointed when they got overtaken by UKIP. Now they're getting overtaken by the Greens. And so they're disappointed about that. They're at rock bottom, and they have not moved for years, despite being in coalition. They don't seem to be taking any credit for the things that are happening. And then you have UKIP, and UKIP supporters are disappointed, because it's not 1950. <laughs> cheap joke, cheap joke. UKIP supporters are disappointed because we're still in Europe, because they're, um, despite their success, they haven't been able to make a breakthrough at the national level, the exception of one or two by-elections, and it looks like at the next election, in terms of seats at least, they're not going to make a breakthrough, and we're not going to have Prime Minister Farage. So they're disappointed about that. And I'm disappointed because I don't know what's going to happen next. I can't stand here and tell you we predict this, because even now it's too far out, which is unusual, because usually around elections we can say, oh yeah, we're pretty sure it's going to be this, we're pretty sure they're going to do that. We don't know. And we don't know because there are some big questions that remain unanswered. The first of these concerns UKIP. UKIP currently around about 15, 14% of the vote. 40% of those people, roughly, who support UKIP now previously voted Conservative. That's more than double any other group. But if you read, uh, if you read books such as The Excellent Revolt on the Right, they, that will show you that actually their long-term strength lies in traditional left-wing voters, traditional old Labour voters. But at the moment, it's the Conservatives. So the Conservatives, if you like, are artificially deflated. They're 33% in the polls. Fact is in the fact they've lost some of these UKIP voters. Last time at the general election, UKIP got 3% of the vote. They're on 15% at the moment. Where will they land at the general election? We don't know. We don't know how many of those people will fall back to the Conservatives, or indeed to the other parties. We don't know how well this argument the Conservatives are pushing, that a vote for Nigel is a vote for Ed. Go to bed with Nigel, wake up with Ed. Horrible image on many levels. We don't know how well that will resonate, how many they'll win back. We can speculate. We know, for instance, that UKIP are not well known for their policies on the kind of issues that people vote on at general elections. For instance, the economy, most people don't know where they stand in the economy. Education, most people don't stand there. Health, most people don't know where they stand there. But will that be enough? Because at the moment, they're part of three sides of this sort of anti-politics <coughs> triangle. With the Greens and the SNP, UKIP have been very effective at mopping up support from people who are dissatisfied, distrusting, and disapproving of politics generally. So that means political organisations, political parties, and politicians themselves. People are angry with all of them. They don't like the main parties. They don't like the coalition. They don't like the opposition. They don't like David Cameron. They don't like Ed Miliband. But will that dislike be enough, or will they fall back? So they'll probably get somewhere between 3 and 15%, but we don't know where. So that's one great uncertainty. Then you have Labour. As I say, they're on 33% at the moment. But if you look at the Lib Dems that have gone from 24% to 7%, the, major, the largest group of those switchers have switched to Labour. And so Labour 
uh, if you like, artificially inflated. Will the Lib Dem supporters from 2010 stay with Labour? Or will they fall back to the Lib Dems? We know that the Lib Dems have a strong incumbency in their constituencies. In other words, if you have a Lib Dem MP, more than any other party, that MP is likely to hold on to their position. And so will some people fall back? We don't know. But Labour were also artificially deflated because of Scotland. At the moment, Scotland are polling 40, sometimes 50% in polls in Scotland. If they do that, they'll win 50 of the 59 seats. Now, we're going to talk about Scotland in a bit later. But we don't know where the SNP will finish up. Will they get more than the nine seats they got last time? Will they get less than the 50 seats that are predicted? Probably. But we don't know where they'll fall. And then we have parties like the Greens, these small uh, parties, that could pick up one or two seats. And all this is a demonstration of the fact that we've moved away from this two-party system. As I say, over the last 30, 40, 50 years, but particularly over the last five years, we've moved away from a two-party system to uh, four, five, six, seven, who knows? We don't know, because we don't know how things will finish on election day. We can look at historical precedent, but we've never been in a situation with a fixed-term parliament and a coalition before. We can look to leader effects. We can say, well, David Cameron's doing better than Ed Miliband, but we don't know how, what difference that will make. We can say, no party has ever come from behind on leader effects and behind on the economy to win an election. That's where Labour are now, but will it happen this time? We don't know. The best I can offer is a suggestion that actually we're looking at a hung parliament, because no one party will get enough seats to get a majority. But then it gets really interesting. And it may very well be that the winner of the election, i.e. the person that becomes Prime Minister, that's Prime Minister this time next year, or perhaps holding another election this time next year, that person may be determined not directly by political opinion, not by what the public says, but as a result of political negotiations. And if it comes down to that, with Labour benefited by the electoral system and being more friendly with the SNP and potentially the Lib Dems, does that mean that they could be going into government? We don't know. All I can suggest is that if you really want to know, if you really want the answer, then follow me on Twitter, <laughs> at Joe Twyman. Because I'm having a competition with the guy that sits next to me at work, and I only need three more followers for the all-important set. Uh, so, we don't know, but these are just some of the questions that we need to answer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, it's, a, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a fun time to be a pollster. And I, I was very worried as an academic forecaster that a pollster, you know, I said, well, it's going to be a tough election for you guys. And, and they said, well, you, you've got a forecast out there. You're in it with us now. And that's a bit worrying because we're, we're having to rely on the pollsters. It's even worse. Um, our next speaker is Roger Casale. Can you pronounce that right? Um, who is a social entrepreneur and founder of New Europeans, um, a civil society initiative promoting the rights of EU citizens. Um, in two years, New Europeans have become the fastest growing pro-European organisation in the UK and is now expanding into other EU member states. Um, he's also the former Labour MP for Wimbledon and won in 1997. I think it's amazing how in, 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 in just a, you know, over a decade and a half how the political landscape has changed remarkably from that kind of period and I remember that election well. Rogers, I think, going to talk a little bit about Europe and the election. I think, actually, there are so many different aspects of the general election this year that, are, that raise fascinating questions, and one is Britain's relationship with the EU. So, thank you, Roger. Thank you very much indeed, Will. And um, if, if I may, I'll say, make a few remarks in response to Joe, and then perhaps the European issues can come out more strongly in the, in, 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 in the questions. But, uh, yes, I think uh, Europe is, is definitely the elephant in the room. In fact, Last time I saw Joe was at a European Movement event, I think, where he asked a, uh, 
crowded room of, uh, uh, of uh, enthusiastic Europhiles what the point was of the European Union. <laughs> and uh, very few of them could give uh, a very plausible answer. And yet, I haven't been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> and that got me thinking, and in fact, the Europeans are going to be having a, a series of events in universities around Britain uh, on this very subject, what is the point of the European Union? Because I think uh, it's very important that everybody uh, has an answer to that question, and I think everyone needs to, to find their own answer to that question, and hopefully they will in time for the referendum, otherwise we're really in trouble. Um, but perhaps that can come out more in questions. I, um, it's interesting also that Joe said, you know, um, this is not 1950, but um, you know, if UKIP continue on the sort of trajectory that they've been on, it may pretty soon be 1950, and I assume that uh, you, like me, uh, don't want to go back to 1950, you actually want to go forwards into the, into the 21st century. Uh, but I, and the, I think the author of the Revolt on the Right was your speaker last, last year. Um, so uh, we certainly uh, don't, want, don't want that to happen. But talking about you know, a decade and a half uh, has gone by, I must say, if I had uh, been, um, if I had my sort of physical death as well as my political death in 2005, and I've been putting a sort of ice fat and woken up again today, 10 years later, uh, in 2015, I think I would be very f surprised to find, listen to the Today programme, as I've been doing this week, in preparation for coming here, and finding that the three principal topics, or three big topics this week, have been foundation hospitals and the fact that they've run out of money, uh, tuition fees, and uh, the, the, the idea that Labour, having introduced them in the first place, now I want to kind of crawl them back and reduce them again. And of course the delay of the Chilcot inquiry. And in, in this, these were the three issues in 2003, uh, foundation hospitals, tuition fees and Iraq, that really led to the split in the Labour Party, which uh, we, we are still living with today, the consequences of that in my view. And I think that will still be very much something that shapes the outcome of the uh, election. So the polls, of course, are very, very important what's happening today, tomorrow, and next week. But I think it's also important to see political events in, in kind of a historical, in a historical context as well. And um, <coughs> I think that uh, uh, if, I, if I was uh, uh, writing today, if I, I've got in, in mind to, to write something along the lines, because if Joe can't tell you, let me try and tell you what I think is going to happen just instinctively, my gut reaction, my gut feeling is that uh, Labour are going to lose the election. Uh, but uh, Ed Miliband will end up as uh, prime, prime Minister. Um, I, I think that, for me, at the moment, is the most likely outcome. It would be interesting to hear your, your, your views as they come out in, in, in questions. And uh, for me, a lot of this goes back, indeed, to what happened in 2002, what happened subsequently. So I think that the problem that the Labour Party, if I may speak, is from a sort of Labour perspective, because I know we've got a Liberal Democrat speaker as well, and then um, uh, New York Business is completely non-party political, but I think you, you advised me in both capacities. I think the problem that Labour faced um, to, uh, uh, later on when they lost the election in 2010 was um, still, get, still goes back to those rifts that began around those issues of foundation hospitals, uh, tuition fees, and Iraq in 2003. And um, one of the main reasons that Labour lost the election in 2010, the last election, was that the party was disunited. Uh, and I think one of the things that Ed Miliband has succeeded in doing is, is uniting the party. And I think one of the most damaging things for the political party and politics is to, is to face divisions. But they face many other challenges as well. And I think one of them was uh, uh, a lack of economic credibility. Um, and I think Labour still face the challenge of uh, being seen as credible economically. Um, they missed a trick there because in 2010, I think what Ed Miliband and Alan Johnson as then was and then Ed Balls could have said was um, we've lost the election so uh, we'll go along and support your economic plans for deficit reduction. Now it's taken them five years to get to that point <laughs> because there was a vote about deficit plan uh, in early this month where they have said we'll go along with those reductions but they've spent five years saying we're not going to do that. And that is, more than anything else, I think, has undermined their economic credibility, which is a significant weakness. Um, and uh, instead of actually saying that there's a national crisis, it's not entirely of Labour's making, there was a meltdown of the financial system. Uh, and that's created this problem, and let's work together uh, to support what the, the, the steps that are needed to put that right. 
Um, we spent five years attacking Conservatives and now we've ended up, uh, they've never ended up supporting. So I think that that ha hasn't hasn't gone very well. Um, I think the issue of uh, leadership. I mean, some people say that uh, Edmund Band maybe is uh, not not a potential prime minister. His brother might have been better. I think these are very much second order questions. I think the, the fact of party unity is absolutely essential, and I think Eppenman has succeeded in doing that, and that was why I supported him in 2010. Uh, and, and I think it would be very difficult for his brother to, to, to achieve the same. And then the other thing is, is political strategy. I think, um, again, here, um, Labour have had, uh, had, had a, lot of, uh, a lot of problems, and another reason why I think they, they're going to lose the election. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest error of strategy was the first election that Ed Miliband faced, uh, and I'm, I'm an Ed Miliband supporter. Um, uh, in the Scottish elections, uh, the last set of Scottish uh, elections in the Scottish Assembly, where Ed Miliband went to Scotland and said, look, this is the first step for Labour on the way back to Westminster. And the Scottish electorate said, well, we thought these elections were actually to do with Scotland, and probably gave, in a situation of proportional representation, the majority to the SNP, and then you have the referendum, and we are now where we are. And people think that Alex Salmond is very formidable. I'm going to hear a bit more about the SNP, but I, I, I'm which I agree with. Uh, but I also think that um, Nicola Sturgeon is, is a class act, and uh, I think there was uh, on the radio today uh, predictions of Labour maybe ending up with five or six seats only in, 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 in Scotland, which uh, um, will uh, be uh, one, one, of the, one, of, one, one of the key things why it, it loses the election. Um, but I think also the rest of its political strategy, which is very much aimed at an organisational effort in the 100 key seats, uh, is also for, for, for get full apart. Um, my, my election edge in 2001-2005 in the woman was Ian McNichol, who's now the General Secretary, so I know him very well. I know how he's operating, I know what he's doing, and I think it was a great strategy two years ago, but I think it was a great strategy for today. Because the ground is being taken from under their feet, even in these key, key seats, and they're losing in uh, seeping votes to, to the Greens and, uh, and, to, and, and, and indeed to, to, to UK. So I think that um, while part of their party has been united under Edmund uh, leadership, um, I don't think that uh, uh, it's regained its economic credibility. Uh, I don't think it's had the right political and electoral strategies. Uh, and, and of course, there are, there are question marks over Edmund Bant's leadership. However, nobody is going to win the election. As we heard from Joe, well, nobody can say that it's going to win the election. So actually afterwards we're going to be in a, uh, a very interesting situation where it's going to be very much down to a uh, different set of leadership skills to the ones that we normally think of when uh, somebody's pitching to have an absolute majority. Because the point about first past the post is it's supposed to live a strong and stable government so somebody can get up there and uh, articulate a national vision. Uh, and uh, hope that they win support for that and then govern uh, with an absolute majority of what Lord Hailsham called a, a, an almost elected dictatorship. I think in the situation after the election this year it's going to be very, very different. And I think this may be an area where Millibank comes into his own. I think the failures actually that I've pointed to that are going to hamper Labour's ability to win the election uh, are not of Ed Millibank's making. I think he's been very collegiate. I think it's allowed Ed Balls to have a lot of uh, power, a lot of autonomy over economic, the economic strategy, and I think that's not going well. Uh, and I think the political electoral strategy is not going, is not going well. And I think this is, uh, these are not necessarily choices that Ed Miliband has made himself, but as a result of delegating this to others. And I think when he, uh, after the election, he will come much more into his own. And I have the, I have the feeling, I know Ed Miliband well, I think in that situation he will actually perform very well. In a situation which is about alliance building, it's about finding a consensus around, uh, around values uh, and building coalitions and alliances, I think Ed Miliband actually might do quite, quite well. Um, now, uh, having said that, what are the kinds of issues that, uh, around which the, this kind of coalition building uh, is going to uh, take shape? Well, um, it, it's the elephant in the room again. I think a lot of it is going to actually have to do with, with Europe. It, they have to start talking about the real issues, the real challenges, the ones that we don't want to talk about at the moment because they're actually unpopular. Nobody wants to talk about Europe, nobody wants to talk about migration, really. 
Uh, don't be surprised about UKIP speaking less about migration than they did in the European elections. I, I don't think they're actually that interested in migration. They wanted to use our migration as an issue to drive Britain out of the European Union, which is their real agenda. And they thought by saying, you know, if all the time we've got freedom of movement because of the European Union, we've got uncontrolled migration, therefore we have to leave the European Union. But the battle over free movement rights has been lost by those who want to uh, restrict free movement or to keep Britain in the European Union. Uh, New Europeans have been campaigning a lot last year for our free movement rights and then fortunately Angela Merkel joined in and told Dave Cameron that you know, there was nothing to do there. If you wanted to be in the European Union, you had to have free movement rights and we've got free movement rights and that principle as well established. Uh, UKIP seems to me are wanting to kind of tack more towards the centre uh, and sweep up roads from everywhere and this election uh, migration is going to have uh, less less vacancy because it doesn't have that kind of instrumental value that it did in, in, the, in the European elections. But Europe is going to be, uh, uh, attitudes towards Europe are going to be absolutely key to referendum building afterwards. And of course on the right, uh, the idea of a referendum and when a referendum, referendum might be will be the key to David Cameron being able to form a coalition with UKIP. But I think that's also going to be a very central issue on, on, on the left. Um, and I think, particularly, I just close on this, I mean, and what your reflections are, post Charlie Hebdo, and post Syriza, and post Podemos in Spain, and so on. I mean, there's a great appetite for uh, unity and change in, in Europe. I mean, despite everything that is happening in Greece, uh, the, there's a st still a strong majority of staying in the European Union. And people are looking more and more to Europe as a way of actually dealing with some of the real problems, the real challenges that we have. And to me, particularly after what happened with <coughs> extraordinary moving demonstrations in France after the events of Paris, this whole, you know, this whole question of Britain's relationship with Europe and what the outcome is going to be of the British general election seem more and more parochial from a kind of European perspective. When you think about the faces, the, the, the problems that we face, the challenges that we face as citizens of Europe. And, uh, Nearly all of those are things that we're going to have to resolve together. If we think about the societal changes and the challenges that we face in the UK, an ageing population, how are we going to meet the challenges of an ageing population, which itself is impacting so strongly on the NHS? A big part of the answer to that is going to be Europe, because we're going to need more people to come here to look after us when we're old. In fact, we get a very, very good deal. Many people come here from, say, Portugal, Poland, wherever, they, wherever, and they work very hard, they look after us in the NHS, and then when they're old, old and tired, they go back to <laughs> Southern America. I mean, it's a very good day. I don't know why we're complaining about it all the time. You know, how are we going to meet the challenges of, of an aging population in this country without migration? How are we going to do that? How do we think we're going to do that? But nobody wants to stand up for, in, in the general election campaign of 2015 and say, we want to have more migration. That's the way to uh, resolve the challenges that are faced by the NHS. And uh, the migration, so we will need migration. But people, you know, let's hope nobody stands up and says we need to deal with the challenges of an aging population the way that we think we need to deal with the challenges of migration. Because how do we deal with the, how do we say we need to deal with, with the challenges of migration? Stop people coming here. Just stop it. Stop the process. That's the, that's the mindset. That's the idea. Well, if you apply that to an aging population. You say, well, what we have to do here is we have to get, we have to persuade people to die soon, yeah, and then we won't have the problem. <laughs> um, we have to, you know, this isn't the way to think. This kind of nationalist mindset isn't the way to think. We have to be more open. We're going to need new ideas. We're going to have, need to see how we can solve things together. The challenge of competitiveness, the economic challenge of competitiveness. How are we going to resolve that without migration, without having high skill? I mean, how many people in this room are studying here come from other European <coughs> member states? You know, I addressed uh, uh, a group of students, in, uh, Erasmus students, in Southampton um, last year. You know, about, uh, I asked about 50, and I said, how many of you, your parents lived and worked in another European member state? And about five put their hands up. And I said, how many of you do you think will live and work in another European member state in the course of your career? And 45 put their hands up. And this is an indication of the, of the, of the, the, the force of change, and mental change in our society. And we need this. We need investment. We need people, we need skills, if we're going to be competitive, and I could, could go on. All, all the challenges that we face, the environmental challenges, climate change, the, 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 the political ones, 
how are we going to negotiate a new trade agreement with the United States as Britain rather than the European Union? So all of all of this, you know, Europe is going to come to, into all of this, um, but uh, and we're going to have to work together, and we're going to have to be united. But all of our politics is pushing us toward not towards being united, but being divided, and to avoid it, talking about the real challenges, the real problems, the real solutions that are needed. And I think it's being exposed as more and more of a kind of game. Um, which is, in, in many ways it is. Um, and I blame the furniture. I blame the way in which the House of Commons is set up. The fact that uh, you've got these um, two sets of green benches, benches opposite each other, government and opposition, as opposed to a more sort of uh, consensual style of politics that could um, come from uh, uh, a, a more, more, more coalition style politics, which would need to be independ in, uh, underpinned actually by, by, by electoral reform. So that's why I come back again to why I think actually Ed Miliband could be, could prove to be the man of the moment if we are really going towards a new style of politics. Uh, constitutional reform, electoral reform, um, the more, more collaboration in Europe, uh, a readiness to work in partnership with other parties. I think this is something that is much, uh, I think Ed Miliband's values are much broader than just the Labour Party itself, and I think he would be actually uh, rather, rather good at building coalitions and, 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 and building, uh, building alliances. But at the moment, we're in this sort of, we're still in the world of the dinosaurs in terms of how politics is run in this country, with um, parties competing for absolute power uh, to control what in a globalised world, in a world where actually consensus and partnership and cooperation in Europe is how to deliver change. Um, and so, uh, we've got weeks and, and months of pantomime to go. Uh, I mean, somebody may say, well, the stakes are still very high. But yes, they are high if you think that somebody is able in today's world in Britain today to win to, to, to win an absolute majority. But it, at the moment, it doesn't really look as if anybody's going to. So what's it really all about? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm hoping the Q&A, the audience will enlighten us on some of these difficult, uh, diff difficult questions uh, because I think they raise these kind of fascinating questions between big issues and the small politics that we, I, I think in some ways maybe these have always been part of politics but we're interested to hear from, from the audience. Um, our next speaker uh, hopefully will uh, run smoothly on to talk about the new politics will be um, Alex Kelso next to me who is Associate Professor of Politics at the University of Southampton. Um, Alex is an expert, I think it would be fair to say, in constitutional law and parliament. Uh, an area that's actually going to be highly topical as the post-election manoeuvring and coalition building takes place. I mean, actually, you know, in, in, if, for those of you who watch uh, in the, the Morgan and all these kind of political dramas, you know, uh, many countries are very used to coalition building and uh, those sorts of politics, this sort of kind of coalition building, uh, consensus politics that other countries are very used to. But in the British political system, even after four and a half years of coalition, we're still kind of getting our heads, heads around it. So. Um, Alex is going to talk about those aspects of, of politics and, and what is happening north of the border, I believe. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, yeah, uh, I'm going to speak, um, I'm going to confine my remarks mostly to the political situation in Scotland. And actually, I'm going to pick up on a couple of things. And Will is right to say, even after close to five years of coalition at Westminster, there is still a sense that it seems, it seems to be something unusual. Politicians, both of the leaders of Conservative and Labour, saying we're, we're heading for victory here, we're aiming to win a majority. Um, and although it may seem new here uh, in, in England, it's something that people in Scotland have been exposed to quite extensively through the devolution settlement, um, which is something I'm going I'm to talk, talk about. But, uh, the first uh, administration in Scotland was a coalition between Labour and the Liberal Democrats in 2009, which was then re-elected, uh, sorry, uh, I've, I've been here too long, I'm losing track of the years, 1999, and it was re and at, at the 2003 Scottish Parliament elections, another coalition between the same two parties was formed, followed by minority SNP government in 2007. So actually, the Although it's unusual at UK level, uh, this, there's a similar story in Wales where there has been exposure of the public to what it means to be governed by a coalition or a minority or something of that sort. Uh, the fact that it seems to be unique at Westminster and as well says it's certainly not unique elsewhere. Um, 
However, I think we also want to possibly take this as an opportunity to rethink what we mean by winning and losing when it comes to talking about elections. Um, people say, so who's going to win the election? I think we really have to reassess what that means. If we are in a situation of multi-party politics, in the old system, winning used to mean you thumped your opposition and you had a whopping majority in the House of Commons. Bearing a complete collapse of the, the smaller parties in UK politics, those days are gone, at least for now. It doesn't mean they won't return, but they're, they're certainly not going to come back barring some cataclysmically unforeseen event between now and, and the general election. So, under those circumstances, we need to understand that winning and losing doesn't have as much currency as it used to and we may be back in situations where, and I think you were alluding to this, where the largest party may not go on to provide the Prime Minister and that has happened before in UK politics where the largest party in seat share hasn't been the largest party in vote share and there's been some uncertainty about how to interpret that politically and that was under a two-party system so we're going to struggle a little bit more to understand what it means in multi-party politics and what that means for the legitimate right to govern and we have already gone through that in Scotland in 2007 where there was a question given that the balance was in a knife edge between the SNP and Labour, who had the legitimate right to try and attempt to govern. Um, so all that's by way of preface uh, to get into the main remarks I want to make, which is focused very much on Scotland. And I think it's fair to say that talking about UK general elections, the issue of what did or didn't happen in Scotland was a really absolutely no consequence. Scotland voted Labour, end of story. You could essentially count the votes, count the seats before you had the election. It was in the bag and those days are changed. And I want to talk about the reasons for that because I don't think we can really understand what's happening now without understanding the really seismic changes that have happened in Scotland. And the SNP in Scotland have gone from being uh, what I think would be safely described as sometimes shrill, um, unimportant, definitely whinging um, commentators on the Celtic periphery who really were of no consequence to people here, particularly in the southeast of England. And they're now key players, potentially key players in a UK general election. As we've heard, we, we don't really know yet exactly how the numbers are going to firm up. I'm going to talk about that too. But the odds are they're going to play some role. And I think the notion of this just 10 years ago was really completely unthinkable. And it's come about because of the structural architecture of the programme of devolution that was unrolled by the Labour government way back in the late 1990s. And it was that, spirit, that, that architecture of devolution that made this possible for the SNP. And that has big consequences for what is going to happen uh, in the next few months. So for most of the, the rest of the UK, we only really got our first glimpse of the SNP last year as part of a referendum um, uh, uh, on Scottish independence. The fact is, though, they've been on the rise for some time before that. They have not just emerged in the last six months or the last year as this inexplicable force in Scottish politics. Um, what happened, I really think, is that devolution offered an alternative prism through which people in Scotland could view the Labour Party, they could view the Scottish Labour Party. And I think the prism of devolution diffused light, it diffused political light in new ways and allowed people in Scotland to perceive political options very differently than they had before. And that was a direct consequence of the architecture of devolution that I just made reference to. And in many ways it prompted Scottish voters, after a couple of, 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 of uh, periods of the Scottish Parliament having been elected and sat and gotten to work, it prompted them to question what it was that Labour represented and whether they really represented the people of Scotland. And this has been a long-standing series of questions that people in Scotland have asked. Um, and what the SNP have been extremely successful in doing is building in those doubts. So yes, there's the post Blair changes to the Labour Party, certainly the Iraq war was a big factor in all of this, but the SNP have been absolute masters of exploiting some of these doubts that have emerged amongst the Scottish population about what Labour stands for. They went on to form a minority administration in Scotland in 2007 at the Scottish Parliament um, and then they defied all expectations in 2011 when they formed a majority government at the Scottish Parliament under a system that was supposed to be explicitly designed to prevent any one party gaining a majority. 
And that's an indication of the level of success that SNP have had on the ground, in constituencies, getting people to turn out to vote for them. And it was that majority in 2011 that gave the SNP the mandate to demand the Scottish independence referendum, which happened last year. Um, and um, although the SNP lost that referendum, I think we have to contextualise that loss. We have to understand what that loss means for this uh, May's election. So I'm going to make six brief points that hopefully will um, uh, illuminate some of these issues that I think are important and worth paying attention to. And the first one is this. What was the loss? The, uh, the loss was 45% uh, uh, voted yes, about 55% no, it was slightly lower on both uh, sides. Before that, even the most generous of polling tended to put support for independence in Scotland at about a third to 35% of the population. That tended to be as high as it went. And there was a very long referendum campaign between the decision, the agreement between the UK government and the Scottish government to hold it, that was agreed in 2012. Between then and then the actual uh, referendum itself last September, that was a long time for uh, a campaign to take place. And for most of that time, the polls were fairly static. Yes, they changed, they went up and down, but it didn't ever really break above that sort of magic 35% mark in a consistently in impressive way. It was the last few months of the campaign that saw change. Uh, in, in the movement of, of, of voters' intentions and particularly in terms of those who were going to uh, uh, come out and vote for independence. And we know that there was the one shock poll that put support for independence at 51% to 49% no, which rocked the UK political establishment to its core. You couldn't get a flight on a British Airways flight up to Glasgow from London Heathrow because the entire Westminster establishment were on every plane to get up there and deal with this crisis in the Union. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is it was the only poll that ever did put the independence movement in the lead, but it certainly was not anything like a conclusive result. Even, a, even when you get to talking about margin of errors, it was in no way suggesting that the thing had been upended. Um, nonetheless, to get from polling around a third to finally on polling day itself securing it was 44.6%, that is, yes I am an Anorak and I'm a member of a support group that can help me with knowing these kinds of numbers, but that is really a remarkable achievement for a party that had really not ever, that had been seen as uh, worthy of support, but not in terms of independence. Everyone thought, wondered, will people vote SNP for the Scottish Parliament? Fine. And they have been a minority, and now they're in majority. But that's in opposition to the Tories, surely, in, 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 in Westminster, when they got the majority in 2011. That doesn't mean people really want independence. But it was actually a rather high number, even although it was a 10-point difference, completely defeated. I remain surprised at how high it was on the day. Um, and I think if you put that to anyone two years out in the SNP, despite all the bluster of we will win it, yes we will, I don't think anyone would have honestly thought they would have got to 40, excuse me, to 45. So the second point I want to make leads on from that, which is that as a consequence, the defeat of the SNP and the independence referendum uh, hasn't been to their detriment. Uh, and that if anyone ever thinks if you lose you're down and out, just take a look at the SNP's fortunes in Scotland to know that there is always hope. Its membership has increased, it stands at above 90,000 members, far outstripping the other Scottish parties. Uh, and its party leader, Nicola Sturgeon, who replaced Alex Salmond uh, when he resigned immediately after the referendum result, has been... Uh, hugely pivotal in engaging and maintaining the engagement of people who got involved. Uh, Alex Salmond, although was a, a fantastic political operative and renowned for his skills, actually was very divisive in some respects with Scottish voters who just didn't really like him in some instances. He kind of was the Marmite guy. Nicola Sturgeon is very, very different and even though she's been his deputy for a long time, has taken on a completely different approach to the party. She's been speaking at sold out arenas where the U2 can't fill uh, to thousands of people gathered. You know, people say you can't, get, you can't get people to come out on a wet Thursday night to hear a politician. If you turn up at the Scottish Hydro last year, she was filling it. Thousands of people coming to hear her speak and still are doing that. 
So this has been hugely important for the SNP. They were not battered by defeat. And that is feeding directly into the strategy for me. Because what they're trying to do is demonstrate that all the promises that were made by the UK parties post devolution have not been delivered and are not being delivered and will not be delivered. And that is so for them, campaigning didn't end in September, it's continued right through. And they've been very successful in questioning the capacity of the UK parties to deliver what they said that they would. And that leads on to the third uh, point I want to make, um, which is that the support that the SNP has gathered um, seems to be carrying through to the UK general election and so it's not confined only to an expression of preference for independence. Um, polls on Scottish voting intentions have put the SNP well in first place, uh, well ahead of Labour and uh, that is significant and it's seismic and it signals a complete transformation of the Scottish political map and of the party system and I don't think we could have, we, we've certainly not ever seen anything like that before. Um, the fourth point uh, I want to make is that despite winning the referendum, this, so this is the flip side of the SNP lost the referendum and yet have gone on to be somehow the victors, despite winning the referendum as part of the Better Together campaign and running the campaign, Labour is horribly on the ropes in Scottish politics and it's very much struggled to gain back the people who turned away from Labour and voted with the SNP last September in the referendum. What the post-referendum polling seems to indicate is that while about a fifth of those who previously identified themselves as SNP support, supporters voted against independence, which is, uh, which is understandable because people voted for the SNP but not because of independence but because they were the opposition party in Scotland, the problem is worse for Labour because about a quarter of Labour identifiers who voted for the independence referendum last year are not apparently going to be easily returning back to Labour for me. And this is a very, very big problem for Labour. There was a polling released accidentally last night, it was leaked, but it was officially released today by Lord Ashcroft, who had, um, there's been some polls that have come out looking at the general uh, voting uh, likelihood in Scotland on a uniform swing. And we know there's problems with what a uniform swing means. The Lord Ashcroft polling went into key constituencies on the ground and conducted the standard surveys there, the, conduct the polling there. Um, it went to the specific seats that voted yes. So we're talking here about the big seats in Glasgow, uh, nor uh, North Lanarkshire, the areas where I come from. It went in there. These were the areas that voted yes, or were on the cusp of voting yes. And the polling in there seems to suggest that although these were previous Labour strongholds, the SNP is set to take them on massive swings in the double digits, sometimes 25% swings. Now those are poll swings we haven't seen since 1997 and it's going to be the SNP that benefits from them if that's what happens. Now I've seen some media comment, I've seen academic comment say previous to the Ashcroft polls, it's not going to happen, it can't happen, there's, not, there's no way these, that it's going to turn out that way, there's no way on these polls the SNP are going to take 50 seats or 48 seats and Labour are going to be left with single digits. If the evidence from the Ashcroft polling is correct, that is exactly what is going to happen because these are the seats that they've been going after. Now, I don't think it's going to be up, up there in the high, four, the high 40s or, or low 50s, but it's certainly going to be substantial. And on that basis, Labour has some, something um, to, to, to worry about. Um, and the reason for that is this. If voters were willing to ditch Labour and vote SNP to bring about independence, why would they return to Labour on something that is obviously less important when it comes to a UK general election? It doesn't mean they're not going to. It's just that the logic of it isn't clear to me. If they were going to vote for independence against Labour, their natural home of Labour, which is a union party, what makes us so sure they're going to return to Labour to salvage it in a UK setup that they were willing to uh, 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 relinquish just a few months ago? And so the SNP has been extremely successful in questioning whether Labour really has the interests of the Scottish people at its heart. And Labour so far has been singularly un unsuccessful in convincing people otherwise. If it had had any success, particularly since the new leader Jim Murphy was elected, they would have made some shift in the polls. And though there has been some, it's not, I don't think, been sufficient to make enough traction at this point, although we accept there's still some weeks to go. And I think something that's been particularly difficult for Labour in Scotland 
is that Labour supporters, long-standing Labour supporters, where being part of Labour is a tribal identity, not so much a party identity, saw Labour in the same campaign team as the Tories. And there are many people, and I know this anecdotally as well as in some of the, the, the more rigorous work that's been done, who simply cannot get over that image because of the Tory brand and what it means in Scotland. Um, so that's left a very bitter taste in mouths. The fifth point I want to make um, is that even if the scale of the potential SNP gains don't turn out to be these 48 seats and so on and all the rest of it, it does not matter because they're going to gain seats. It's almost undoubted that they're going to make significant gains and this is going to signal a seismic shift in Scottish party politics. And it's a shift that's so far been masked by first past the post at UK elections. In other words, this shift hasn't just happened since September. It's been a long time in the making. Um, I've already mentioned some of the big areas, so Glasgow, Dundee, North Lanarkshire. Um, these are the, I, I grew up in North Lanarkshire and I spent um, a, a lot of my young adult life living in Glasgow. These were the areas where you just weighed the Labour vote. And if you weren't going to vote Labour, you might as well just not bother turning up. People now know that there is a point in turning up. Glasgow voted yes for independence. Uh, Glasgow in 2012 um, uh, had uh, uh, the SNP gained some seats on the city council at the expense of the Lib Dems. And we know that in the Highland areas of Scotland it's the Lib Dems that have certainly got something to worry about here. So those times have changed. The idea that if you identify with any other party in Scotland except possibly the Lib Dems if you live nor in the north or Labour if you live in the central belt in the south, you might as well not bother turning up. That's changed very much. And finally, the final point I want to make is the question of turnout and participation. Now, the turnout in the Scottish independence referendum was 84%. I think you have to go back to the 50s to find anything even remotely like that at a UK general election. That compares with 63% of Scottish voters in the 2010 general election and a low 51% of voters for the Scottish Parliament election. This is where the problem lies then for the SNP. The SNP became a majority administration in Scotland on a 51% turnout. Can it convince the people that turned out to vote for independence to come out again in May and vote for them? There's a big difference, as you can see, between 51% and 84%. So a lot of it is going to come down to can it con continue to convince these people to vote for it, and if it can, will, it, will they come out to vote for it? to vote for them and I think that's going to play uh, very much into it. what is the turnout and turnout is going to be crucial. Are the same disaffected people going to come out? So to sum up, yes, okay, the independence referendum didn't result in the breakup of the UK state. Hallelujah, we can all thank, ourselves, th thank uh, the voters of Scotland for that. But it has caused a big shift in the tectonic plates in constitutional politics and in Scottish politics. And it's prompted us to think about our constitutional arrangements, things like English votes for English laws and so on, things that people generally don't think about at all, and for good reason. Um, so I think constitutionally we're in for some really interesting times. And for me, um, if the SNP come to play, there's some prediction that they could be the third party. And if they come to play any meaningful role in coalition negotiations following a hung parliament, there's going to be real questions asked in England about what that means and whether that's appropriate and what that tells us about where political power lies in this country and where it ought to lie. So I think although there's the electoral questions that are exciting, I think there's the constitutional questions that we're already talking about and are going to only get more important in the next few weeks. anti-politics triangle and yet anyone in Scotland says this is we're not an age of anti-politics this is look at look at Scotland for the intensity of political debate and engagement uh, so there are some really fascinating questions our final speaker uh, um, uh, today is Martin Todd Martin was the 2010 parliament, parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Democrats in Winchester he's also a councillor of Hampshire, Hampshire County Council and Winchester City Council and a member and so he's extremely active in local politics uh, and is also a member of the Liberal Democrats Federal Executive, so I'm highly active in both in, in national politics as well. Will give us 
his, your, your perspective on, on the forthcoming election. Thank yeah, well, I, I'm, <coughs> what I'm not going to do, I won't take particularly partisan line, and I'm also not going to come out with some clear forecast of exactly what's going to happen. Obviously, I've seen lots of secret polling, but, um, <laughs> but uh, anybody who says that they know exactly what's going to happen is probably wrong, and I don't want to put myself into that category. I do think it's incredibly interesting political times at the moment. I mean, really quite unexpected, and, and often some of the details are different from what you would think them to be. I mean, the first thing is, um, when you're fighting a seat on the ground, you very often look at what was going on in the previous election, and let's think back to 2010. So we've got the Conservative Party. It had no threat on its right, so it didn't need to worry about losing right-wing voters. And if you remember, David Cameron, was making this big play for the centre ground. It was all about vote blue, go green, you know, three letters matter to me, the NHS. So David Cameron's battleground in the last election was all about how can I get seats off, off Labour but also off the Liberal Democrats by, I can, I can basically bank my right wing vote and I can appeal to the centre ground. Classic kind of reverse Blairism, you might call it. But, but uh, and again, making a very similar pitch, you know, competent on the economy, but we care, sort of thing. Same, the, the classic centre ground campaign that, that is, is very common was, again, what Blair did in 97 um, onwards. And yet now, he's got this huge threat to his right. He's withdrawn from the centre ground to a large degree. I mean, they make sort of attempts on it and say they're going to ring fence the NHS and chuck a few things at pensioners, although it's not quite the same thing. Um, but, but it's very hard to see in those circumstances how they can possibly get more votes on more seats than they did last time, unless you start getting very strange movements in individual constituencies, because you just can't see where those seats would come from. I mean, who, who are they? Yes, they might take a few from the Liberal Democrats, but if that's going to be harder for them than it looks, and there aren't enough of them to, to take them a particularly long way towards winning. And they will be, you know, if I take the example of Winchester, um, the areas that they won really big are the areas that UKIP is doing very well in. So actually, even seats that they won last time, they're going to be finding difficulties in that maybe they they weren't expecting. Then you've got the Lib Dems. So obviously, you know, there was the whole Clegg mania. Now, in practice, Clegg mania didn't translate into, so he was very popular after the first debate. It didn't translate into seats quite as much as some of us would have liked. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, in terms of national polling, uh, the wheels have fallen off to a large degree. But again, what's striking um, and this is quite an important point. Elections are not a national poll. They are 650 local polls. And if you start looking at what's happening on individual constituencies, a lot of the evidence is saying it's not as bad as people would expect. And I'll come back to that, why that might be in a minute. Then you've got Labour. Now, I, you know, the, the long-term trend where you've seen the two big parties in decline from 95% in the, in, in, the, um, in the 1950s to whatever it was in the last election, sort of 70 percentage. A, a huge driver of that in the last few elections has been the growth of the Liberal Democrats. That was actually what was driving the loss of the two big party vote. And Labour might reasonably have thought, well, you know, with, the lay, with, with Lib Dems in free fall, a lot of the tactical voters will come back to us, and indeed, that is exactly what's happening. Um, and somehow, the whole situation will turn around again, and, you know, we're back to the big party, two-party battle. What's been astonishing is that the combined vote of Labour and the Tories has continued to decline. So, actually, just the whole concept of the big party, the, the party that loads of people are members of, that it's actually part of people's social life, part of the infrastructure of society, has not gone into reverse. And you know, any, if these were normal times, Labour would probably be thinking they were more or less home and dry. But as has been explained, it's, these are far from normal times. And, and Labour, well, Labour do not seem to be doing as well as you would have thought. And again, think back to 2010. It is almost impossible to exaggerate how unpopular Gordon Brown was in certainly the southern part of England. I mean, he was politically toxic. You would have thought the combination of 
the collapse in the in the Lib Dem vote and not having Gordon Brown would be some kind of transformational recovery mechanism for the Labour Party. But it, it doesn't feel that way at the moment. Um, so, and, and, and there's a lot of, one of the reasons I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the election is very often elections come down to quite big questions. That's how it feels like when you're fighting an election campaign. Often the trick, if you're ever fighting an election campaign, I'm sure some of you will, the real trick to an election campaign is to define the question that the election in your area is about and then answer it better than the other parties. So unfortunately in Winchester last time, the question was defined very effectively by the Conservatives as how do we get rid of Gordon Brown? That was the question in Winchester and the Conservatives answered it better than I did and so they won. And that was broadly what happened. And if you looked at the polling, what was... The interesting thing about this election is it's very unclear what the question is. Because there's lots of sort of competing forces at work driving votes in different directions. You know, is it politics versus anti-politics? Well, kind of, but will that take us through to the election? And is that really something that you use to vote in a, in a general election rather than a by-election? Politics versus anti-politics, absolutely, in a by-election, off you go. Give them all a kicking. In a general election, when you're deciding you know, who sets the taxes, runs the economy, and runs the NHS. Then, of course, there's the kind of personality question, Ed versus Dave. Now, the polling says that people probably on balance, if they're asked to choose between the two, as people slightly hold their nose and think, they at the moment, I think. That's what the polling seems to say. Um, <coughs> economy versus the NHS. These are the two areas that the Conservatives and Labour are trying to define the election as being about. Um, and it's interesting in the concept of the, of the, of the kind of Blairite approach and, and the Cameroonian approach, if we use that as the short term for what Cameron was trying to do in 2010, which was, it was to make it a both and thing. And Cameron's kind of trying that, but not very hard, because frankly, people judge parties by their acts. And, and they're not a both and party, and that's not how they've been delivering. So the Conservatives, in the end, want to make the election about the economy. They're going to say, you know, we've got this marvellous recovery, which actually most of us don't really feel like we're experiencing, and would you like to put it at risk? That's, that's what they want the question to be about. And Labour is saying, you know, you remember when the NHS used to be, NHS used to be a big disaster, and we turned it round, and look at it now, it's all starting to go wrong, we're really sure. Both, interestingly, arguments that you could argue at play towards the older population, but then that's a fairly common phenomenon. Um, which is older people vote. So, you know, they're the ones you worry about ultimately if you want to get re-elected. And even change versus continuity, I'm not even sure that that's clear whether people want everything to change or not, whether the majority of people want things to change. And at the heart of that, one of the things that's really weird about this election is that there doesn't seem to be a battle for the centre ground, really. You know, because it always used to be the kind of centre ground, kind of populist policies. There's been a lot on both parties where you see them sort of shoring up their base vote. I mean, the classic thing that parties that have got hammered in general elections tend to do is think about choosing a leader that kind of appeals to the party itself rather than to the electorate. And that's arguably... You know, that's a question that I think is interesting about Labour. Is he, is Miliband the equivalent of um, William Hague, the first leader after they got hammered in 97? Now, William Hague, as we have since found out, is an intelligent, interesting, capable person. You know, he's not horrible. But in the run-up to 2001, the British public decided they absolutely hated him. I mean, they just, he was toxic. And I know all the leaflets we were running, I was a candidate then as well, it was, you know, William Hague's Conservative candidate. And that's how you describe people. And it was, you got the name William Hague in there as much as possible, you used the picture of him wearing the baseball hat as much as possible, just to remind people how much they really didn't like that particular candidate. Is, you know, is Miliband the same? Did Labour, because 
you know, parties tend to win when they get really, 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 really serious about winning, which is, in the end, what happened with Labour in 97, and to a degree with Cameron in 2010. He wasn't really able to deliver his party fully. Is Labour really, really, really serious about building a big enough alliance to win? And I think the, well, let's wait for the Lib Dem tactical vote to come back to us and kind of bank, bank our base vote strategy doesn't actually smell like that. It doesn't smell like somebody really wants to pull together a big enough coalition to run the country. That's just, that's my take on it. Um, then you've got um, the Lib Dems who, I mean, you know, I, I appeared in the media a little bit. In fact, I trended on Twitter for a while because I made some <laughs> comments about the leadership of the Liberal Democrat Party after the May elections, the, well, the, the, the uh, European elections. And that's an interesting question because there is this thing that either is a Lib you know, one of the things that will be interesting in seeing what happens with Lib Dem uh, MPs is will people be deciding locally or nationally? I mean, the, the MPs will be trying to make it all about them personally and the situation in their individual seat. Their opponents will be trying to say, do you want Mick Clegg again? Um, so that will be an interesting phenomenon, and that could be a factor in determining how many Lib Dem MPs we end up with. Um, then you've got, um, I mean, the Conservative Party we talked about. The Conservative Party, very tortured at the moment, and again, suffering a think from being incredibly tactical and being driven to being very tactical through fear of UKIP. They don't really appear to have, they've got a sort of a strategy for winning. And it may be enough to get them through, but it's not going to be enough to get them a majority. And then, then things get interesting, and I'll talk about post-election negotiations in a minute. Um, you've got UKIP. Now, I'm on a council with UKIP councillors, and it's very interesting, and it's different from what you would think. Um, because on the one hand, you know, if you read the newspapers, there are they have complete lunatics within their ranks, and they haven't worked out yet that you do need quite robust systems in political parties to, to filter out the nutters. Um, and all political parties have these. I mean, basically, you have an approval process. The process of becoming a candidate in a political party um, uh, is effectively, there's about three questions you get screened on. You know, are you competent? Do you actually believe the same things? And are you a nutter? And those you get filtered out by that, then you need to persuade the local party in some form or another to adopt you as a candidate, and then you need to win. So there's quite a few steps to go through. And it's interesting, actually, Labour, I think, there's been a cultural problem within Labour through the central belt that a lot of people have not had to bother with the last vote. I think one of the cultural problems with Labour, one of the reasons they were so crap after the last general election in negotiations is that they've got in part, a culture of brute force in terms of resolving internal arguments, which, which MPs who haven't had to win elections, but just have to win internal selections, um, you're not one of those, but there are, you know, central ballot Labour MPs do need, did not need to win over the public, and so didn't have those skills. It was one of the reasons why Gordon Brown wasn't as effective as, as Tony Blair. And, and why I think I'm more sceptical about your point about what will happen after the election, but I'll come, come back to that. Um, UKIP, UKIP are a really interesting party because they are amazingly, they're much more diverse than you would think they are. They have this common phenomenon, basically. They, they, they do broadly believe that immigration is the problem and the EU is the problem. On the... On the um, County Council, there's a range of views. Some, some of them are populist, basically kind of local populists, and they buy into the other stuff as a kind of way of getting against the establishment and the status quo and wanting to change things. There's a very odd phenomenon of what I would call red UKIP. I mean, the leader of the UKIP group in the County Council, and unfortunately the video isn't available on the County Council website anymore, at the last budget meeting, made what was a and he had a very strong with a Pudlian accent as well, a pretty good impression of Derek Hatton explaining what was wrong with the country, basically, that it was international capital and bosses and immigrants. And he threw in the immigrants and the EU. But it really was a pretty good kind of 
trot Labour, Little Puddley and speech from the 1980s with the EU thrown in at the end, which was quite a surprise. And, and, but, it, you know, but he got selected as an MEP candidate and he's very popular within, within the party. So it's interesting also if you talk to their voters and you talk to the traditional... Um, uh, traditional, their traditional support. There is a very big anti-international business, anti-globalisation element in there that I think is underestimated in terms of their support. One of the things I think is quite interesting about UKIP is for the people, I remember talking to some guy on the doorstep about this, uh, probably hate the politicians to do this, but I remember having a long conversation with a guy on the doorstep who was going to vote UKIP. And he'd had a solid, you know, manual work job for many years. He was actually a foreman. He worked in a security company. He repaired, I think, cash machines or something like that. And a really good job, well paid. Um, and the company had been bought by a Danish man, as he saw it, and he'd been made redundant. So this Danish company had come in and admired him. And he was driving a minicab uh, on a zero hours contract. It was, uh, he was a driver on a, mini, on a zero hours contract, so in other words, when he was contracted to drive, he got paid, and when he wasn't driving, he wasn't being paid. And he, his take was, particularly when he looked at the kind of Westminster culture, and the fact that all three party leaders are former special advisors in one form or another, and they never, none of them had a proper job, and they're all kind of glossy and wearing suits. He just looked at the status quo, and he just thought, these guys haven't got a clue, frankly. They absolutely, they just haven't got a clue. And I said to him, well, so do you think UKIP's policies um, are the solution? And he said, no, not particularly, but they're the only people who seem to recognise that my problems exist, which was quite interesting. So I think there's, there, there's an interest, it's quite interesting when you talk to UKIP voters, the policies aren't the important point, actually, for many of them. It's more a sense of these guys get my life, and and there's an in, it raises interesting questions about what's happened to the culture that politicians come from, the background they have, and the lives they lead, and their ability to connect with people. Um, and then the Greens, I think the Greens will be interesting. I think the Greens are about to under, about to discover what what happens in a general election. And, I mean, there's a couple of things, and this is, this is something that people need to bear in mind um, when it comes to fighting seats on the ground. It, it was possible for UKIP two years ago to kind of rock up and win county council seats with no effort and no activity on the ground. That is not how general elections work. Um, they are extremely intense, extremely high pressure, and in target seats, amazingly expensive and amazingly high resource. And it may be there's some people who get in, but you actually need a level of kind of operation in order to fight a general election that I think may be problematic. And then the other thing that the Greens have discovered, and actually it happens to Lib Dems in 2010, which is when people think you start to be a threat and they turn the light on you and start looking at your, can your policies, that can be a bit of a brutal experience. So I think it would be interesting to see what happens with that. Again, they will, be, you know, they will do better than they did this time, this time but I think, they're, I think it's hard for them not to fall back between now and the general election. And then the last point that people talked about is what's going to happen after the election. And I think that's incredibly interesting. Firstly, the one thing that's likely to be different is that there may well be choices. Because in practice, one of the weird things about 2010 is that if you were going to have a stable government of any kind, there weren't actually a lot of options. You couldn't really construct a majority in very many ways, particularly after some of uh, the sort of more traditional Labour uh, people that said they would bail from any kind of coalition, which happened fairly quickly. Um, I think I think the point about personality is important, and the ability, you know, the, the ability to, to work consensually. Um, and I suspect uh, that was why to, there was a commonality on that, which is what made the coalition negotiations work this time. But one of the things that was very striking last time, um, and it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, in negotiation, the benefits come to the people who are best prepared. And 
it's very striking that one of the reasons, of, if you read all the accounts of what happened in the days after um, the election, it was clear that Labour had done absolutely no preparation at all for talking to anybody about anything, as far as anybody could tell. I don't think they, you know, I don't think there was anybody who'd read the Lib Dem manifesto with the lens of what might we do with these people. Um, I don't think there'd be much thinking, by all accounts, of what you do in a coalition. I mean, they've not rung up their colleagues, socialist colleagues in the European Parliament to say, what do we do in coalition? They've probably not even spoken to people in Scotland, uh, as far as anybody could tell. Um, and it's, I was reading an account, a paper that's just been published um, about the mechanics of coalition and on some of the details of the working of Whitehall, the, the, the Tories absolutely creamed the Liberal Democrats in the negotiations just because they understood what you needed to be getting in terms of ministerial structures and processes in, in, within, a, within a coalition. So there are all kinds of things that are quite interesting. What will be interesting is people may well have choices. You know, Ed Miliband may have a choice between the SNP and the Lib Dems. Uh, the Tories may have a choice between the Lib Dems and UKIP and the Ulster Unionists. And that, that suddenly adds a whole level of uh, complexity to the negotiation process and to a degree weakens the hand of the smaller parties if there's another option for the larger parties to be talking to. And then I think the last thing that's really interesting is, again, it's a long-term trend, and, it, and it's, it's playing out in our politics in very strange ways. It is the nature of the union and nationalism, you know, and the decline of Great Britainism and the UK. I mean, it's very odd if you look at how culture has changed. I mean, I remember when I was growing up, you would hear about the Royal Navy and the United Kingdom and you know this empire that we had. One of the very odd things about Britain's intolerance to foreigners is that we spent hundreds of years rocking up in other countries and going, hi, we've come to run the place, and then shooting a bunch of people, <laughs> and just, and running it, you know. And it, it's one of the, it's just a kind of cultural observation. It, I find it incredible that we have zero awareness of this in our discourse. You know, we kind of turn up in Iraq and we don't realize that we actually gas bombed the place in the 1920s. Um, I, I find it, I'm sorry, it's just a side point, and it's very odd, this kind of retreat from globalism. You know, we used to think it was our job to go and run the world. Um, and it was the, you know, it was part of, well, God, had, God was an Englishman, therefore we should head out and run everywhere else. And that's gradually retreated, because now it's a pretty hard case to make. I mean, UKIP is, well, it says it's the UK Independence Party, but in practice it smells like an English Nationalist Party. The Conservatives are pretty close to being an English Nationalist Party. If, if the results of the elections come in Scotland, we'll actually have an English, English and Welsh Labour Party, and not a, not a very Scottish uh, Labour Party, which will have another, you know, what will the long-term impact of that be? And, and similarly, you might end up with a kind of Cornish Liberal Democrat Party, but anyway, we'll worry about that later. Um, anyway, that's enough thoughts to be going on with. Um, uh, so, yes, as I said, lots of interesting questions, but still no idea what's going to happen in the general <laughs>
I spent the last general election in Scotland. Um, and one of the defining characteristics of that election had been a number of seats that are sort of their traditional Labour vote had drifted away and been depressed. <laughs> and actually, the only seat that changed hands at all in the entire country at the last general election was a by election win that went back to Labour as their traditional vote revived in the face of a, a Tory party. And, and uh, for the month that I was there for the actual general election campaigning, it was a palpable sense that the Tories were coming and Labour was what was required to protect you. Because there was this visceral hatred of, of the Conservative Party, as you mentioned. Do you think the SNP are going to have that say? Do they have the sense that they can protect you from a rampant English Tory party who are going to come and do the terrible things that they did before? Or is that going to be the thing that unhinges the SNP? Um, Rod. Rod Rhodes, it's a question for Joe. Uh, I assume the YouGov poll is uh, a national poll. One of the things the parties do is they poll the marginal constituencies. I attended a session like this uh, before when Curtis was speaking, and he was of the opinion that Labour support at the marginal was actually well substantial and holding up, and he was predicting a majority of 20. So why is John wrong? <laughs> Darren. Uh, hi, Darren. I'm um, one of the famous Southampton alumni. Um, uh, I suppose my question's for Joe, but I'd also like to hear from the former Labour MP on this. Uh, after your first round poll of the uh, uh, electoral posters, which seems to suggest that people were agreeing that uh, Labour's posters were more effective than the Conservatives were saying that uh, their posters regarding that they cut deficit in half actually wasn't working, do you think? that that uh, defeat, as it were, is explained why they've, more, they've shifted to a more personalised attack style posters with uh, Ed Miliband saying your worst nightmare with impairing them with Sinn Féin and the SNP. Say the panel has been started with Martin. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> um, so. Well, I think, I think that the interesting question about the... Um, can the SNP protect against uh, the Tories? It's going to be an interesting one. Um, uh, because um, that comes back to the thing I talked about, which is defining the question. And will that be the question in Scotland? Will people be thinking, you know, if, if the mood of the election turns into a, look, it's resurgent Tories and UKIP and Labour's in free fall, um, then, then actually then it may... It, it partly, it depends, I think, it will depend on what's happening within the election. If it looks like Labour is collapsing in Scotland or collapsing overall or not doing well, then obviously SNP will be the answer to that question. If Labour suddenly starts doing quite well, but the Tories are doing well and you see the collapse of smaller parties in England, then that might say Labour's the answer. But I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know enough about the, the situation with the Scottish, whether the, the breaking of... Um, the kind of machine in, it sounds as if the breaking of the machine is a permanent thing and the risk for Labour is they might literally just not have the skills and the abilities and to know how to win people back in that kind of situation and that's a, a, it's a really interesting question which I guess any time will tell um, in terms of the individual polling versus the national situation um, I, I tend not to look at Tory Labour polls. I'm sure, I'm sure, again, for the reasons I talked about, I just can't see how the Tories are going to be going forward in this election. So I think if you've got Tory Labour marginals, I think Labour will be picking some up. But if Scotland happens as, as everything seems to suggest it might, then, then that might just bugger up the arithmetic, frankly. And actually, a point on the SNP, what the SNP might be trying to do, and what Sturgeon's been saying, uh, is using a neutralisation argument, which is, well, we would work with Labour to stop the Tories. I think she's been saying that, hasn't she? Which is actually quite an effective way of saying, don't worry, it's safe. You know, you can vote for us and you won't get a Tory government. And then the last point about posters. Uh, I'm not sure posters decide elections, actually. They're quite fun, and media like writing about them, but, you know, if I had £1,000, I'd spend it on direct mail and spend it on a poster. 
much do you want to use this? Well, I, I pick up the, the, the point about uh, why everybody is um, attacking Miliband. Um, and I think the reason for that is that um, there's a growing uh, awareness that um, the country may wake up after the election with, uh, well, not the next day, but a few days after, once the uh, negotiations have taken place, with Ed Miliband as the Prime Minister. Uh, I mean, Labour support. I mean, I, I know I'm here in my non-party sense, but I think I'm, you're always asking me as a former Labour MP. Um, see, I, I hope that that, that that can happen. I think you, you can see why, uh, uh, you know, it's getting more and more shrill. We've had these attacks from uh, business leaders in the last few days on Ed Miliband, and I think uh, as we go towards the election, um, these personal attacks will become more and more intense. And I think that the TV debates will be a um, very, very key this time, as they were last time. And, and I think uh, you may find that Ed Miliband comes out of that uh, rather well. Because you've got to think about, uh, you know, we, we tend to kind of judge political leaders uh, by the kind of standards of the past. But if it's true that we're going towards a new kind of politics and we need a new kind of leadership to be exercised, and I don't think we quite understand yet what that, what that looks like. Um, and um, so I think don't underestimate it. You know, people underestimated him in, in the contest with David Miliband, and I think they're underestimating him now. And I think there's a growing awareness that he may very well be the next Prime Minister. I mean, Martin is, is, is right to say it's difficult to predict who's going to win the, the next election. I mean, the one thing that Martin was right was to predict that for absolute confidence that Liberal Democrats are, are the only party who can say um, that they're not going to win the, the next election. Uh, I think there's a you know, I think actually, to be fair to the Liberal Democrats, they have performed quite, quite well. I think they've got some excellent people they've gained, uh, they've gained some, you know, they, 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 have, they have actually tempered the coalition, and I think they've got some, some first class politicians actually, Vince Cable and people like that. Um, but I think there is a basis for a new kind of politics. I think that, uh, you know, the rise of the SNP is, is uh, also thanks to the constitutional reforms that they were introduced after 1997. I think it's clear that the SNP are very upset about this whole business of tying up English votes for English laws with the promise that was made on the eve of the referendum for people in Scotland, and they're really angry about that. So I think there is uh, some credibility behind Labour's pitch to say if a coalition agreement is going to be built around further devolution. I mean, but equal Labour have been the kind of victim of their own success there because it's created the opportunity for the SNP to break through. But um, I think the answer to your question is that there is a growing awareness that um, Evan Van may very well be the next Prime Minister, and I think the scrutiny on him as a leader will intensify because that seems like his opponents as a, as a as weakness in Labour's uh, in Labour's strategy. But as I've tried to say, I think weakness is actually lying. And they live there, but they may, but, but, but don't judge them by the standards of the past, judge them by the standards of the future. Uh, and I think that the weaknesses in Labour's strategy lie elsewhere. And when I said I think they will lose the election, I don't necessarily mean that they will not be the largest party, but they will lose in the sense of which a lot of Conservatives feel the candidate lost the last election, and they came out as a minority party, becoming an absolute majority. Um, equally, it's very difficult to see how the Conservatives can do better than they did last time. Um, I think one of the big, if I might also just take the opportunity, I think one of the biggest um, problems that we face as a, as a country, actually, um, one of the one of the saddest things in politics, and one of the most dangerous things, is the way in which the Conservatives have abandoned their traditional, more pro-European stance. Because if you think about Winston Churchill, the call for the United States of Europe, and who introduced the Convention on Human Rights. Uh, you think of people like Macmillan, who made the first application for it to join. You think about Ted Heath. Even Margaret Thatcher, before, uh, well, Mar Mar I, actually, I find that I pray up Margaret Thatcher and aid more and more in the conversations with Conservatives. Because Mar Margaret Thatcher in the middle of 1980s, pushing for an increase in qualified majority voting uh, to complete the single market, you know, compared to Conservatives today, is absolutely kind of mainstream pro europe which is pretty much a position of an organisation called Open Europe, who want to see the completion of the EU, which is actually quite close to the sort of ultra liberals in the, in the Labour Party. Um, the Conservative Party have completely gone off into the woods on the, on the European issue. I don't think people like David Cameron, are, are, that's really their position, but um, they, they've become so anti-European. Of course, the problem with it is that 
at the grassroots. And if you are a Conservative candidate and you stand up at a selection meeting, and you say, and you mention the word Europe, or there's something good in, that you can connect with the idea of Europe, you're not going to get selected. Uh, I've, been, I've got a good friend who's trying to become a quite kind of reasonable, rational, moderate person who's trying to become, and I'm wishing well, who's trying to become a Conservative candidate. He's quite pro-European, and, and really, frankly, doesn't stand a chance. And that's, that's very, very bad news. So we're going towards a new style of politics, and leaders will need to be judged by the standards of the future, and not the past. Um, Alex, you yeah. I'm just going to comment on that one question and I'll keep it uh, to two points. First, um, there's two dimensions of it. First, can the SNP convince those Labour voters that they have gained that if they continue to vote SNP, it does not mean that they will end up with another Tory government. I think that's essentially the nub of the question. Well, they voted Labour in 2010 and ended up with a, a Conservative Lib Dem government anyway. At least they have, there are some Liberal Democrats in Scotland, so at least that, that, that added some legitimacy. But it looks very likely that most of those are going to go, including Danny Alexander. So in terms of any Lib Dem coalition negotiations, they're going to have lost one of the key negotiators because he's probably lost his seat at this point, barring a miracle. Um, but, so there's that side of it. Um, how, how well enough people to believe that that is going to be the outcome? And the flip side, and I think you touched on this, is something that both Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond have been pressing, which is that voters shouldn't have a fear of having to vote Labour, because if they vote the, for the SNP, whatever happens, it's going to be an overwhelming number of seats shared by Labour and the SNP, which is by definition an anti-conservative majority, overwhelmingly so in Scotland. And since the SNP has already said that it would support Labour in a coalition, but certainly would not enter into any negotiations with the Conservatives, the Scottish voters should feel assured that an SNP vote doesn't show the back door to, to the Conservatives. But there's an added element to it, and I'll end on this, which is that I think people in Scotland have finally become quite tired of the argument that unless they vote for Labour, the whole country is going to go to hell in a handcart. And the idea that the conscience of the union rests with Scottish voters who can't otherwise make any choices. And we heard that during the referendum. Scotland had to remain in the union or else we would have rabid capitalists running the country and everyone in England would be doomed. People in Scotland just stopped buying that argument and I think they're likely to have ditched that at this point. Um, I'll ask Joe to close and provide a final comment, but just to say that um, there'll be food and drinks outside, I hope it's been set up. So if you have any further questions, interrogations or predictions, uh, please stay around afterwards. But Joe. Okay, I'm going to be very quick because I'm both hungry and thirsty. Uh, Rob, I'll ask your questions about marginals first. Why is JC wrong? Who would dare question the great John Curtis on predictions? Uh, the reason is uh, to do with, if you like, the raw materials of his predictions. Uh, the marginals, we know, their polling is very, very fluid in individual constituencies and I expect that his uh, prediction will be revised substantially as we get closer to the election and marginal polling both in individual constituencies and in groups of marginals comes out because of course we know that the election is not actually a battle of 650 seats, it is a battle of about 150 seats where those results are decided. Uh, John and Darren, I'm going to kind of answer your questions in the same way. Uh, what this is, and actually some of the points that were made, this comes down to what is the strategy and what is the big question that is being asked. And I think the strategy that the two main parties will push repeatedly is essentially this. They will be asking the question, do you want to hold your nose or do you want to cut it off to spite your face? Those are the options that the parties will present. That's what vote Nigel, get Ed is based on. That's what a vote for Alex lets in the Tories is based on. That's why the, uh, the Conservatives have changed their poster to look what happens if you don't vote for, uh, if you don't vote for us. And so they're going to try and bring back those, those uh, voters who have moved away from them. They're going to try and bring them back and sort of rebuild the two-party system. The degree to which that resonates in uh, Scotland with SNP supporters was made clear, is, is uncertain. Uh, but I, I'm sure that's why the SNP are making it clear that, that repeatedly that they will not side with the Conservatives to almost make it safe, as Alex said, safe for those Labour supporters to stay with the SNP so that they can get the numbers. 
The degree to which this resonates, the degree to which that works, hold your nose or cut it off to spot your face will decide the election. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank again Martin, Roger, Alex and Joe for a really fascinating series of talks and uh, we'll talk to you outside our home. Thank you very much. Everyone.